uh, enough about this phase that we're going through. And we're very much at the beginning, well we certainly are, um, your panellists, of learning about this phase. And the reason I guess that we are up here is that um, we've kind of dived in uh, and we've got some early thoughts about what we're doing, um, but we're very aware that we have a big room full of people, uh, which signals a lot of interest, but also a lot of people who have also dived in and are doing stuff. So our job as the panel is to really get this discussion within the started, and we're thinking about impact investment and its relevance in what we do around market systems change. So, with that very brief introduction, which was nothing of substance whatsoever, um, I'm going to introduce our panel to you. And just to say that what we're going to do is, is talk to you, um, give you kind of two windows into thinking about impact investment. And one is an initiative that a group of NGOs have started. Um, we're certainly not the only NGOs doing this, and you know, some are ahead of us and some are slightly behind. Um, and to talk about that, we have uh, Mary Ann, who is the commercial analyst for ACAN. She's based in Nairobi and works throughout Africa um, for the ACAN consortium. And we have Patience who works for my organisation, which is Practical Action. And Patience um, is an, I was going to say an inclusive market specialist, but no, a market system specialist. And she works for our consulting company, Practical Action Consulting. And so Patience kind of does the market systems work and links up with mary -Ann on the impact investment stuff. So they're going to, together, talk to you about Acre and where we're up to with it. And then Alexi, who, I'm really sorry, I'm slightly hiding here. Alexi um, from Adam Smith International, he's a technical advisor in their inclusive growth team. And he's going to give you their perspective, what they've been discovering as they've been looking at the issue of impact investment and where it fits within um, the market systems that they're working. So, I'm going to hand over. Um, I'm hoping that as soon as a short video has been shown, we can get the curtains open. Because we'd be right up on the eighth floor. It'd be quite nice to have some natural light. So, over to you, uh, Marianne and Patience. Thank you, Alison. Thank you, everybody, for being with us here today. So, we'll kick off with Acre. Acre is a consortium of the five NGOs that we can see um, illuminated there. Christian Aid, Practical Action, Challenges Worldwide, Tradecraft, and Twin. Acre is using impact investment as one of the tools in the toolbox that is market systems approaches. We're leveraging on enterprises, ethical business, whom we have had partnerships with over the years for market linkages. We're leveraging on them to further achieve social impact. So these businesses are operating in sectors which are often considered very risky by traditional funding. They are operating unproven business models and half the time they don't have very clear strategies to scale their operations. There's expensive funding in these countries and even where they qualify the requirements are very rigid. They're being asked for 100% plus in collateral, among other challenges. So today we're going to tell you what our experience has been working with these businesses and carrying them through the journey to impact investment. And we'll play a short video. She has trouble getting affordable finance. And that's where we come in. After assessing how the business is doing, a business expert spends two to three months working with her to develop a plan. The expert helps Asanda to improve the elements of her business, such as governance, financial management, and operational practices. She needs to develop a strategy for growth and a business plan. Acre experts review the plan in detail and make suggestions to help Asanda refine it further. 
Asanda pitches a business plan to the Acres Syndicate investors. And with the help of pro bono legal support, structures a deal that will allow her business to grow, and just as importantly, will have a significant impact on her local community. Together, we can help hundreds of businesses like Asanda's to thrive. So that, in a nutshell, is how it works and how we were able to support these businesses. So Patience and I are going to give you a couple of examples that we have worked with in the last one year when we've been in pilot. Patience is a market system specialist, is out in the field, she knows the terrain, she knows which businesses are working with smallholder farmers and what kind of social impact they have the potential to scale to. So Patience will identify those enterprises and then we'll refer them to me. And what I bring to Acre is a commercial background, having worked at Barclays Bank for eight years, working with SMEs and supporting them in turning around their operations. So one of the lessons we have learned is market systems approaches help us in identifying the right businesses. And we have an example of a business in Zimbabwe, which patients will take us through. So what we did was, um, Practitioner market system programs helped in identifying the company. Then from there, what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to then support the company to, to design a, a, a product that then addressed the challenge that was identified. So the private company was identified, it developed the product, but it's now at the stage where it also needs impact investment to also reach out to new markets as well as commercialize. So, Marianne will take you through what we did on the ACA to try and support this enterprise. So, once patients and her team flagged this enterprise, there was a problem. So, they have put in money for R&D, and a product has been developed and piloted, and social impact has been demonstrated. But this has not been commercialized. We have not been able to see revenue that will tell us whether this is commercially viable, enough to present it to impact investors. So what we have done is we have put together a business support package, which is again being funded by philanthropic funds, and then we've invited consultants who are giving us a pro bono service to test cash flow projections for this product and tell us whether indeed it is commercially viable, and if it can be commercially viable, what kind of social impact are we looking at? And then we'll put all this together into a business plan and then present it to impact investors and see where it goes from there. So that's the first example. And that's you know, based on our learning that using our deep expertise in market systems approaches, we can identify potential enterprises. The second learning is pre-investment support is fundamental. We've been speaking to impact investors, and one of the challenges they have constantly highlighted is that all these businesses out there, they all have fantastic models, but they are not investor ready. And we don't want to put our money into you know, that first pre-investment phase. We want to be able to come in to deploy uh, funding and then do post-investment. So as NGOs again, um, we're putting together business support packages and addressing that particular challenge for impact investors, de-risking that for them. Uh, increased interest in understanding how market system development programs, either as part of their programs, work, work through debt and equity instruments, or at least collaborate with uh, a, a component of investment being put in in, in that kind of um, uh, using those kind of mechanisms. What we're also seeing is that in the, the, the ideas around how to deploy those kind of mechanisms by, by donors and, and development finance institutions, we're also seeing this idea that it should have leverage. So, you know, the, the donor money might be invested in debt and equity, but the long game is that it's, it's, it's intended to uh, uh, de-risk the landscape, or essentially it's intended to then promote private investment, and, and that's the long game. So, you know, if DFID chooses to 
make an equity investment through one of its programs or one of its vehicles, you know, it's it, it's not. I mean, it's a means to an end rather than than the end itself. So at Adams Bank International, um, when I arrived, I, I was interviewed and I was asked, you know, what are going to be the the big trends in the future in economic development? And I probably made the mistake that I, I thought maybe impact investment would be one of them. Um, and I just got a glazed look and a lot of skepticism. But um, what, what I, I did get the job, and once I started, I was encouraged to try to, uh, as part of a few people looking at this, to try to understand you know, how, how this stuff fits and what, what, what lessons do we have um, from existing market systems programs in trying to encourage investment into thin markets, into difficult market systems, um, um, to, to try to, to draw some lessons. and. Uh, give us some insights about how these kind of debt and equity instruments uh, might be deployed and how they would be deployed and how they would collaborate with market systems. So I got on the phone and I, uh, you know, when I was traveling around, I spoke to a lot of our programs and Adam Smith International has quite a big portfolio of market systems development programs working in lots of quite diff difficult locations. And um, the conversation often started a little bit like in my interview where there was just this glazed look, massive skepticism, um, impact investment, it's, it's, it's a fad, it's, it's hype, you know. There's a bunch of high net worth philanthropists who are trying to give away their money in a way that makes them feel like it's commercial and, uh, and, um, and so they're doing impact investment, but for kind of the, the significant uh, uh, direction of economic development and the tools that we have to promote economic development, impact investment isn't really a thing. It's, it's um, you know, the, 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 at the end of the day, investment is incredibly important um, and promoting investment into difficult markets is something that we, we need to promote, but impact investors not necessarily um, uh, playing a big role. So. Um, I thought I'd present two particular specific examples from two specific projects um, and, and, and try to draw a few lessons to, um, to kind of justify what I've just said. And that, that what I've just said might sound quite difficult, but I, I, I think this session should be about discussion about how people understand impact investment, whether they think it's relevant to their work, and if it is how, and if it's not, for that to be recognised with also this long view that donors are looking at debt and equity instruments and there might be some messages to donors based on market systems approaches about what what we can be advising so you know what what do the cases that i came across um, tell us so we work in sierra leone we have a, a market development program called sober in sierra leone it's the only market systems approach in Sierra Leone, only market development program in Sierra Leone, and it's operated throughout the Ebola crisis. So you can imagine how much, uh, how many results we were able to report during that period. But we had operations and we had a team on the ground. Now, one of the sectors that we worked in, or the, one of the market systems that we've selected to work in, is agri inputs. What's interesting about Sierra Leone and agri input? Farmers do want to use them. Farmers do buy seed, farmers do buy fertilizer. They'll travel a very long way to Freetown and the areas around Freetown to get hold of them. But on the supply side, those distributors and retailers are very much in Freetown they, and, and, and near Freetown. It doesn't really, there's not significant distribution networks. The products available, there's not a diversity of products and typically the quality isn't great. And the business models are quite, they don't take into account some of the things you see in other parts of Africa around uh, using um, software to aggregate demand and, and, and ways of, of, of making uh, input supply through rural distribution more effective, more efficient. Um, so within that context, we recognize that investment promotion into what was a very thin market, there were also there's not, not a lot of players in Sierra Leone in the input sector. And, and, and we recognize that inward investment from, from companies from beyond Sierra Leone that had the better quality products, the better quality, the, the, the new ideas, the ways of making it more efficient, was, um, as well as the, the capital required, it was also all the, the skills and, and, and that knowledge. And so 
because we've been in Sierra Leone several years and we've been stuck in Freetown with Ebola, we, um, we, we were actually probably the organization that you, um, you the Sierra Leone uh, farming sector, pretty well. And so we created an investment kit and we sent it out to lots of companies around Africa telling them that Sierra Leone, there are a lot of farmers, farmers wanted to use inputs. But, uh, the, and there were, there were local distributors, but they were really struggling, and there was a great opportunity. And we got, we, got a lot, we got a lot of companies getting back in touch with us, asking for more information. So a couple of things we did, uh, we use a couple of specific examples. One is a partnership that's emerged with Seedco. So Seedco were interested, um, they came over to Freetown, we took them to see some farmers, to, to see a number of distributors, and they identified a distributor that they thought they could work with. We've worked with that distributor around developing a model of revenue and, and volume of sales that would um, basically have a, a threshold criteria for them to be able to work with Seedco. And that relationship's now been established, and I can't tell you how it's going, but the Seedco is investing into this local partner to established distributions through this partner. Um, <coughs> the other example was is, is a company I think based in Nairobi called iProcure, who are a, a software company and they basically use software to aggregate smallholder demand um, and then negotiate discounts uh, based on smallholder demand for inputs. Um, and they, they can also generate insight into uh, the market share and, and, and who's buying where and, and basically use that to run promotions on behalf of input companies. And in, in, at that company as well, we, they came over, we showed them around, we, we, we talked through the, the data that we had about uh, the input sector and, and as a result they've established a subsidiary in Sierra Leone and they're going to give it a go with cost sharing their operational costs as they get going. So. I think the key point of that story to me is that when I started asking about impact investors, what, what turns around to me is saying, well, actually what we did is investment was, investment was really important. We recognized there was a gap in, in, in financing. We also recognized there were a gap in the skills in the Sierra Leone market. And we actually went out to commercial investors beyond Sierra Leone and tried to attract them in and the profile of investors are actually commercial firms and they're, invest they're, they're, they're in some cases private equity packers behind them who are the ones who are entering Sierra Leone now who are investing in the uh, ag input system. The other key insight I think from that story is that the role that the market system development program played. We essentially acted as, a, as an investment promotion unit. We had lots of local insights, we basically knew the smallholder market better than anyone else and we were able to give robust, um, yeah, um, we can debate on the definition of robust, but we gave them convincing information about the local market to these international firms who really didn't know very much about Sierra Leone and it was enough to get them get them in country. And then of course we did some work around building the capacity of the local, the local distributors, the local players who had been selected as being potential partners for the international firms. So interesting to see what the role of the market system development program was in this case. So my other example is Mombasa. So we have a youth, um, youth employment project, um, DFID funded again, uh, it's called Kuza. So Kuza, very quickly, it's got a demand side aspect to, to the program, so it's working on a, a set of selected systems which we believe that if they grow they'll create a lot of jobs for young people. The program's also looking at the supply side of skills, skills development and how young people who, who are out of work can get skills training. But cutting across that, especially the demand side, was again a, um, a recognition that investment is a massive, investment is a massive gap in, um, in Mombasa. So it's that, that, that's an interesting thing to think about because uh, within East Africa, let, Kenya's got the lion's share of investment. Nairobi is full of private equity, full of financial development, um, 
development finance institutions full of impact investors. But you go over to Mombasa and it's really difficult to find a single significant example of, of investment into SMEs. Um, and actually it took us two years to find one. And I'll tell you a bit uh, about the one that we found and what we did. Um, but in, in that case, we, we, we tried to understand why, that, why that's the case. And I guess the, the, a few things that come out are probably quite, quite obvious, quite intuitive, but I think it's, it's important to remember those things when we're thinking about connecting impact investors or investment to, to, to some of the market systems. First of all, um, the SMEs in Mombasa, mostly family owned, mostly pretty conservative in their business planning. Most of them absolutely not interested in getting a third party equity, you know, giving away equity in their business. So, you know, that's a start. Secondly, the business networks in Mombasa, they're very linked to kind of the religious and kind of um, ethnic networks within Mombasa. And basically for an outsider, like a private equity firm, um, being in Nairobi is fairly straightforward to start understanding the, the landscape. Going to Mombasa is very, very difficult. Um, on top of that, Mombasa, there's just not that many enterprises. There might not be that many enterprises that, that would be a profitable investment. There's just not that much pipeline. Whereas if you're based in Nairobi, you know, th there's lots of pipeline you can look into. In Mombasa, very little. So I think the key points there was that um, the program was actually agnostic about what kind of investors they were trying to bring in. Um, we spoke to impact investors, we spoke to private equity, we spoke to financial uh, development finance institutions uh, across the board. Um, it's very difficult to, to attract investment. Um, the final point I'll make about Mombasa is, um, oh, I was going to say what we, when we found, we eventually found an SME who had taken in, um, had given away equity to get some financing. And, and it was actually a quite a well-known local firm. A lot of the SMEs knew it. And, and, and so we organized an awareness raising event where we got that, that company to actually talk about what it's like accepting private equity into the business to try to kind of generate changing in the social norms of beliefs of, of, of what getting outside investment is like. Um, and I don't know if that's going to make a significant change, but in that awareness raising event, what we also realized that we didn't know is that actually there's a, lot of, there's a lot of investment happening in Mombasa, but it's actually inside Mombasa. It's across local companies and it's across community, uh, community business networks. And actually there's a lot of flow of investment going around uh, locally. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at now is what, can, can we leverage that? Can we, can we encourage investment going in through that? So the, the final point about Mombasa is a big transformative opportunity for investment is they've changed the regulations about fish processing and there's a big opportunity in Mombasa for, 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 for fish landing and processing. Um, that would be a, a 15 to 20 million USD investment, probably a consortium investors, investors combining uh, foreign um, um, development finance institution investment private equity, commercial, probably a big consortium. And Kuza, our project, in the scope that it currently has, we're able to go out and talk to individual private equity firms and impact investors and so on. But kind of building that kind of consortium or raising awareness around that kind of consortium for that kind of investment that would be genuinely transformative because of all the secondary industries that would come out from such a significant infrastructure development. Um, you know, our, our kind of project doesn't have the capabilities or the scope to do that. So I've been told I really need to finish off. The, 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 key, lessons, the key lessons is um, we take an agnostic view of investors. We look across the whole spectrum of investors. There are different interests. There are different profiles. Obviously, some are, you know, most of them are kind of profit oriented. Some of them might be interested in the social impact. But for us, we kind of look across that entire spectrum. What we do as well is, is, is you know, depending on the specific context and the investment need in that context, there are different types of investors who are relevant. And we'll go to those investors. Um, another point is that we've recognized the market systems 
development programs often have enormous local insight about the local context. Um, and outside investors do benefit a lot from that. And there is an opportunity. Sierra Leone is an example where we really leverage that knowledge, that insight. Um, and the final point is specifically on impact investors. Um, I would love to open the room and hear about other examples like, like Acre around really working on impact-oriented investors. We found that they often have specific ideas of what they want to do. And if you're trying to bring something to them that is about contributing to a, a change in the system where the direct impact's not immediately clear, it's, it's really difficult to get that conversation off the ground. Whereas leading with potentially profitable business with commercial investors actually has been easier for us. So I'll leave it there. Great, thanks, Alexi. Questions about what you've heard. Um, but we're hoping that that's going to lead into discussion because we're aware that you've heard about two approaches and impact investment is a really kind of big space um, with lots of people doing lots of things. Um, you know, it's not tightly defined. It's not one thing. Um, so uh, we're going to have, have some questions. And uh, if you want to make a point as well, that's absolutely fine. Um, but so we'll, we'll talk a bit about the presentations and, and then we'll get into some discussion. So I'm going to take rounds of three um, for the panelists. So, yeah, go ahead over there. I have a very fundamental question. Impact investment. What, what is impact? What, how do you define impact in a situation? In, in a country like Sierra Leone, which is similar to Liberia, what is impact? How is that different from Mozambique? How is that going to be different in Kenya? What is impact? So I know now exactly what sort of investment that I need or I should look for within my program. I guess that fundamental issue of impact, can you help me out with that? So uh, I just wanted to see a quick show of hands of um, who here is from a for-profit organization and who here is from a non-for-profit. Not-for-profit? Okay, and for-profit? Okay, so it's about 50-50. So I'm with Aga Khan Foundation, um, not-for-profit, and we engage in social development. I'm particularly in the Tanzania office. So very similar work around um, working with smallholder farmers and kind of that market system around it. Now, my question is for you, for the panel, is um, what do we see the role of not-for-profit organizations? When you think of impact investment, you think for profit, you kind of think of the commercial side of it. And I think, uh, for example, Aga Khan Foundation, we've worked with over 50,000 smallholder farmers in southern Tanzania um, across the value chains. And so I think that's something, I mean, there is there's an aspect of technical assistance that we could provide in an impact investment model. Uh, and I just want to know, I mean, and then it gets, I think it would get pretty complicated with um, an NGO and then a for-profit company and then an imp impact investor. Uh, and just, I wanted to hear what you think is the role of an NGO, what, what it could be, and kind of some advice around how you think that could be structured. I'm Wadi Love Sansone from SNV Zimbabwe. My question is on looking at the acre process, what, what goes into the due diligence process of actually then finally awarding a particular company, what are the, the key steps that you are involved in there? So when we're considering social impacts in ACA, we use the IRIS metrics. I don't know if some of us in the room have heard of the IRIS metrics. So this, you have, great. <laughs> so, um, so we look at a business and ask ourselves, what is the revenue now? And what revenue are we projecting with investment? How many employees does this business have? And out of this, how many are part-time? How many are permanent? And what is the projection with investment? And then we also ask ourselves, if it's an agricultural business, how many smallholder farmers are you sourcing from now? And how many are you planning to source from with investment? And then we also ask ourselves in terms of volumes, so if it's um, agricultural produce, what is the volume now and what is the volume with? 
investment. Of course, it's context specific in some countries. And we begin with a macroeconomic research of that country to ask ourselves what would success looks, look like and then proceed to address it from that perspective. Then you asked about the role of non-profit organizations. So for me particularly, um, coming from the private sector, I'm having an appreciation of having colleagues like patients because they understand the terrain in a way that private sector does not. Private sector just thinks about profit. I mean, it's all about the bottom line. But when I talk about social impact, I cannot conceptualize it as well as as patients can. But secondly, we're leveraging on donor funding, for example, to de-risk um, the impact investment process. So for example, business support is being funded by donors. So for ACRE, these NGOs have massive leverage in that context. They've been here, they know the donors, and they're able then to leverage on that, to source for that funding. And then you asked about the due diligence. So from the video, we have three steps. So the first one, we have a set of ACRE filters where we ask ourselves, um, what is your social impact currently and what are you going to achieve? Then are you able to absorb um, investment of say $100 million up to $1.5 million? Because for us, that's what we've identified as the missing middle. Do you have financial accounts that can demonstrate commercial viability now or potential for commercial viability with investment? And then are you performing some market unblocking role like the e-commerce business in Bangladesh that I just mentioned? So that's the initial set of filters. And then we move to technical assistance where we bring in consultants to try and address some of the problems we have identified. And then we leave the third level of due diligence to the investor and we step out of it. I can also add on the impact side of things. I think we, as we look at impact, we are looking basically at three levels. We are looking at the individuals that will benefit as a result of transformation that will happen in that particular market system. So you are basically looking at employment creation, or you're also looking at increased incomes that might happen at the individuals. So it's quite diverse, but you also look at the enterprise level, there's impact that's going to happen there, like the growth in terms of the business. So we are also looking at that. You're also looking at if the access affordable finance, what they want. We're also looking at that as impact. So then we also look at it from a market perspective where you're looking at strengthened market systems for the benefit of everyone. Then um, on the other question that was also asked about um, the role of non-profit organizations, I think um, I would say not all private sectors might um, be interested in reaching out to the poor, or they might be, so you'd find that um, the role of the NGOs, the NGO there will be to also identify new market opportunities like the way we did with the, um, the software development company. They, were, they didn't see a new niche in also working out with the poor that were also interested in them getting to. So by then reaching out to that new target group, which can be also a potential market, um, and also increase their business, we are also helping them reach out to potentially new markets. Um, yeah, so th I think the question about impact, uh, Yokwe, um, so a lot of impact investors, so the investors that call themselves impact investors, which means that they're pursuing a social development impact alongside uh, hopefully a financial return and are willing to take a lower financial return in order to get that social impact. So that's, I think the Global Impact Investment Network has defined itself impact investors as, as being that. I think there's also an angle about environmental, so it's also environmental. So. Um, we've done we've done some work around looking at how impact investors measure their impact, and what we found is uh, there's lots of really good practice uh, in a variety of areas. But something that we do see quite quite often is um, the kind of the the way that you conceive your impact is quite um, it's quite direct. 
It's about the numbers of job you create. It's the number of uh, smallholder suppliers that you're you're, you're using. It's uh, maybe that the income uplift of those smallholder farmers by working out like how much you're buying from them and how much you're, you're paying them and so on. Um, um, and especially those that might be getting support from 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 donors, they'll they'll have that pressure to be kind of recording numbers. Um, but a story that I was told by another impact investor who's really thinking about kind of economic transformation and, and systems change is a story about their work on avocados in Mozambique, where basically they worked out that you could get international export, European export quality or import quality avocados, just like South Africa. You could get it in Mozambique and you could get it to the market three months before the, the, the South African avocados could get to market. Just you know, like the profitability of that model, enormous. And it took them four years to get there, these impact investors, and they made an investment on a small hub farm that I think had 12 outgrowers. And for four years, when they were being asked, what's your development impact? Well, they didn't really have many outgrowers. Um, they weren't creating jobs. They had like two or three jobs. But having worked out that you could grow avocados like that in Mozambique and get them to European markets three months before, they managed to crowd in um, the biggest, biggest avocado importer into Europe to invest in a plan for 2,000 hectares of avocado in Mozambique. Now, the interesting bit of that story is for the first four years where they, because avocados, you grow on trees, and so they also take a long time to grow. So for, for four and five years, they had nothing to say about direct impact. But what it got to is that it's one of the most transformational stories I've heard in impact investment. But it's, it's only just now that you've got this big um, South African avocado exporter who's investing now massively into, into Mozambique. So yeah, uh, the issue of impact, I, I would say we need to think through what impact means in, in investment because it's often not this kind of direct impact. It's, it's more about if you can make an investment that turns out to be profitable, then it's going to crowd in other investment. Great. Alexi, can we, yeah. can we come in? So I want to understand from maybe both of you why you think that profit for-profit investors sometimes are more interesting, and then why do you think it's better to have like more of impact investors are they more willing to take more risks? Or so, what is the even how you classify investors as for-profit? Because they all want to have profit, right? At the end of the day, but you see, I'm interested in that distinction. I'm here, so I'm, I might as well take it. <laughs> yes, indeed. I have, I have two related questions. Um, in, in normal business situations, an investor makes the, the pre-investment or the background work. Now, in this case, the model is transferring all that cost to, to the donor. Do we have an, an, an idea how much it costs to do all this tier work per dollar invested? Uh, and is there a limit to that ratio? And related to that is, we're talking about market systems. Would, is there a chance that we are distorting a market that we should be levering? Be because, you know, and I think that's really my greatest concern. I'm, thanks a lot. I'm really keen to come in on that because uh, I, I, exactly because I, I, I think um, I mean I guess I, I'm Jane. You know I'm with the Beam team, but I also am the team leader for the program coordination unit for Diffid's Impact Program, um, which um, in a sense comes at things in, uh, from the other end, maybe from Acre. Um, the, and, and one of the things I wanted to sort of you know um, draw out was it's a massively diverse and very young market. Um, and in a sense, the purpose of the Diffid's Impact Programme is to build the market for impact investment and not distort, not crowd out, and so on. And it's very interesting hearing more about ACO, and I've come across ACO a little bit already, and I think it's a great initiative. But it's almost bottom-up in the way that the Diffid Impact Programme is top-down. And we do a lot of work with the GIN and, and other um, market-building organisations within the programme. But we also, and I wanted to draw out this contrast as well a little bit, we, um, we um, invest through CDC, the UK's Development Fund, 
financed institution some diffid money, but I would suggest probably in a very, very different way to the kind of ways that the examples, um, Alexei, that you're talking about um, is using diffid money more directly to invest. Because pass that money through, if you like, a proper investor like CDC, and they approach it completely differently and much more in the way that the private sector does. Um, and I, I've got lots that I, I would like, want to say, but the, the, the one thing I'd just like to sort of slightly challenge is the, the, the sort of opening line of, in 20 years' time, will we, will we be talking about impact investing? Um, because, in a sense, I think um, it, that's, that works, that's the kind of thing that works us out of a job. Um, so I, I, it, it's a, it's, it's uh, the, the various sort of groups I've been at, non-donorized. It's a very non-donorized area, um, and people, people in um, talk about the um, um, equator principles, ESG, and things like that. And they, we've been doing this for years, and it's been growing for years, and it will continue to grow. And sort of certainly from my perspective, I see this as something that will continue and continue to build and build, and be a really important part of the development um, sort of landscape going forward. Um, so I, I want to address the one about um, who, who are impact investors and how do you differentiate them from for-profit. So the spectrum is such that on one end you have donors uh, giving grants or subsidies and then on the extreme end you have commercial investors who are investment funds, banks, individuals. Then in the middle you have people who are trying to straddle both ways, who are trying to say that we want to ease out of the dependence of aid but at the same time we want to do it softly in such a way that then the enterprise can be eased into commercial funding. And the thing with social enterprises is they're too early stage to attract purely commercial funding. So their first round of capital raising will have to be soft. And then once the business model has been tested, then they can go to a second round of capital raising from the more commercial based. So it's really just smoothening that journey from subsidies into commercial, commercial debt. And then about TA and whether we're able to quantify that, I mean, as he says, it's still very early stage and there are discussions ongoing about how somebody can pay for this and it's factored into equity that is disbursed or debt. But right now, this is how we have to do it as we, as we test it. Okay, I think also adding on to what Marianne is saying, I don't think um, the TA process will have an impact on uh, distorting markets. The way I would look at it is um, the way the technical assistance has been designed is um, yes, it will be funded through donors uh, to try and improve the business functions of the enterprise that will be targeted through ACRE. But in that process, there are some roles that the private companies will be expected to do with their own money. So it isn't at the moment. Um, just in terms of the definition of impact investors, we, we found, uh, this isn't going to give you a definition, but we've just found a couple of interesting things that kept cropping up when I was interviewing people. One is um, you get private equity out outfits who um, say they're impact investors because there's ways of getting some money to set themselves up. Um, and then actually, uh, there's not very much to, to see whether you know, what, what is impact about, uh, against them? And I've got nothing against private equity at all. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a very powerful vehicle and I think it's the future. And I think I'll answer in the second part of my answer about how, how market systems projects um, and, and this kind of donor funding works to make the most out of private equity. But yeah, one of the things we see is that we've got private equity firms in Nairobi is a great example. You've got loads of them that set themselves up and they talk the impact language because that's how you set yourself up. Yeah, on the other side of the spectrum, you get impact investors who are actually so interested in the impact side, actually they don't care. They don't care about the financial returns and actually they'll, they'll, the due diligence side of things is all gonna be about impact and then there's gonna be quite a heavy weight put onto 
um, onto kind of the impact reporting demand. So I, I guess the point is that there's a massive spectrum and, you know, each, uh, each impact investor tends to have quite, I found they have a very strong, uh, you know, set of values instead of kind of rationale, reason to be, uh, and, and actually kind of getting to know the different ones and what they're really doing is actually really important because they're so diverse and they, you know, they can, if you really understand them, perhaps you can use that knowledge about who's doing what and who wants to do what to, to introduce them to businesses that you're aware of that might fit their, their interests. To the point about, um, about uh, you know, CDC's impact investment going through the funds that they invest in, I think that there's, there's a lot of money going that way. There will continue being a lot of money going that way. And I see the role of, of well, we see the role of market systems development programs to be about um, how do you get that kind of investment to go into the thin markets. So in the case of Sierra Leone ag inputs, you know, through what mechanism are you going to get some of the C CDC money going through some regional investment fund going into tackling the issue of ag inputs? And probably most likely is if there's a co regional commercial firm that's that's shown to be profitable in other regions, that's interested in market entry in Sierra Leone, they've already got relationships with, with their, equity, their equity partners, and it's likely that they'll be able to then get more equity to enter Sierra Leone. And, and so the role we play is getting that commercial, you know, that commercial um, uh, regional organization to, to, to try out going into Sierra Leone, and that's the role we play. So I work for a company called Winwood Commodities, and we invest in downstream supply chains. So a few glazed faces. So, uh, so what we do is we, um, we started uh, with our, our CEO, was the head of Shell uh, Global Marketing Team, and he developed a brand called V-Power. And he basically said, if I can brand the most boring black sludge in the world, then I can brand anything. So we then moved into the Caribbean, and we set up a, a, a sugar business where we have an equity investment, uh, and we helped the sugar industry in Barbados regenerate itself, reposition itself. One thing that we haven't really discussed in the last day and a half is competitiveness in terms of world price and preferential treatment. Uh, the world price for sugar is $350 a tonne, and the cost of production is $1,000 a tonne in Barbados. And there are lots of similarities between some of the countries that we work in in Africa in terms of low economies of scale, high cost of labor. So what we did is we basically branded sugar. We invested, we, had, we, we made an equity investment with the, a joint venture with the government of Barbados. We branded sugar. We developed a whole new supply chain, and it's now in shops in the UK, such as Waitrose, Fortnum & Mason. It's a high-value product, and we've now, we're now able to pay uh, farmers uh, about $1,000 per tonne extra. So it's helped regenerate the whole industry. So when you're talking about impact, yes, we've uh, created additional income, but we've also helped to actually reposition a whole industry through branding, supply chain, management, uh, good distribution. So uh, I just wanted to comment on, on a couple of things. So risk, uh, risk is, is, is one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, we have a ratio which is one, two, one. So one of our brands will fail, two are marginal, one will succeed. Um, and that depends on which type of brand it is. So uh, product brands like Coca-Cola, uh, you know, they can be extremely high reward, but very, very high risk and difficult to enter the market. Then ingredient brands uh, are sort of less risky, but less reward. And then sort of certification things like fair trade, uh, soil association, rainforest alliance, lower risk. So what uh, my interest in, in being here and um, talking to all you guys is that actually there's lots of compliments with some of your projects. And we've worked a little bit with a uh, project in Zimbabwe. Uh, and they have helped us de-risk our initial investment to set up a honey brand and supply chain. Um, and now we've launched that brand. It's, it's in places like Spa and Pick and Pay. Um, so that really, I think, ties in with some of the stuff that you've, you've been saying. These are really risky markets. If we wanted to retire, we would start branding stuff from Brazil, 
uh, India, China, where they can compete on world price. And there's probably only a handful of agricultural commodities that can compete on world price from Africa. So that's when the branding really comes in to add value to that product, position it in a unique way, find new market channels. Um, and the other thing is developing a pipeline. So there's, there's hardly any people that we would invest in that haven't already been invested in. So if you look at the Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund list of projects, there's about, about 200 projects. They're the only people that you would really want to invest in. Um, and you talked about Baobab, so I'm pretty sure I know who that is. And he's got a grant from ACF, and he's also got a grant from everyone else. So. Um, Working with these sorts of projects is really interesting to us because it, it, it allows us to find new, uh, develop a new pipeline and in some respect de-risk uh, our work. So anyway, there you go. I thought I'd share that with you. Sorry if I banged on. Alison, tell me. Hello, this is uh, John from Oxfam. Um, Oxfam has an impact investment program as well, so we're facing some of the experiences and challenges that Acre, uh, Acre is facing. Um, my question builds on the market distortion, distortion point, I think. At the beginning, you identified a number of problems that SMEs face in your countries. Arguably, if SME development is to succeed in those countries, those problems have to be addressed and solved. So how does Acre relate to those problems? Do you see Acre's role as somehow influencing those problems? Or is there any danger that Acre potentially could undermine actually those problems getting resolved and solved? So you identify problems of lack of banks being interested, for example, uh, in those sort of enterprises in the country. One more. Any of you at the back have any? Sorry? <laughs> Uh, to the Acre colleagues, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship with the investors. Um, are these the traditional impact investment funds that, that many of us m know of? Do you meet with them early on and discuss what type of businesses they would like to invest in, and then you work with them hand in hand during the pre-investment? Or do you engage in that pre-investment TA, and then you shop that business plan around? So I'll take the second one, and then on market distortions, um, patients and can, can support. So in terms of our interaction with impact investors, so one of the key strengths of Acre is that we're not running a fund. So it's a syndicate of investors, each coming to the table with different requirements. So we have high net worth individuals, we have institutional investors, and some of these investors are people we've had a relationship with as donors, but now they want to recycle that funding um, as, as, as impact investment. So most of them will come to the table with different requirements. Some of them are saying, I will only do debt, others I'll only do equity, others I'll only do Africa. So once we get a business plan, then we identify who would be interested in it, say two or three of them, and then present that to them, and then we see who will actually pick it up. So that's our current relationship with investors. Um, They've asked me to just talk about the distortion point uh, for a couple of minutes. And it was really interesting in the session that we had this morning, um, Simon from Diffid, I don't know if he's, he's here. No, he's not, but anyway, I hope I'm not misquoting him. Um, but he was, I, and I wrote it down because I thought, oh, that sounds familiar. Um, he was talking about arguments that they had, they used to have in Diffid about um, technical assistance for investment. So is it that there were a group of people who said it's for leveraging, and then there were a group of people who said, no, 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 it's subsidizing the private sector. And um, I thought, oh, yes, you know, that, that's the space we're still in. Um, because you're asking these questions because they are very important questions to ask. And of course, there is an element of subsidy. And it is uh, a, a sort of, I don't know whether you call it a dance that we have to do or a, a very, you know, stony path that we have to tread along. Um, we have to try and get it right and be really aware of, of what we're doing. And um, are we, you know, leveraging 
or are we over subsidizing i mean it you know, the investors themselves have to do due diligence, and it is our plan that that investors, once, once things get going, will pay for more of what needs to be done. Um, but to the gentleman's point from Windward Commodities, and it was absolutely great to have you contributing, thanks very much. Um, if we'd known, we might even have had you up here. Um, but uh, so I think, you know, what we're what we're trying to do is is do something that we're we're trying to get the balance right we're trying to get investors in a position where they have options that are attractive to them whatever they want to do and our job is to try and provide that pipeline and i you know it made me laugh your your uh, little story about the baobab guy or business, um, you know, who's obviously clearly a good operator at, at getting stuff. And everybody knows there is a dearth of pipeline. Um, and that's what we're working on. And that's what we're really keen to work on. Um, I think Jack wants to make a specific point about the dearth of pipeline. And I'd be really keen to hear from people in the room who agree or disagree with that, and agree or disagree with that being something that actually we, as a market systems development community, um, can usefully be doing, whether we're, and since I've got the mic, sorry, whether we're for profit or not, because actually, I think in this room, that distinction is slightly artificial, because what we're all doing is trying to facilitate market system development. And what we're trying to unpack here is, in our role as market system develop market system development facilitators, a bit of a mouthful, um, you know, where does impact investment fit into that, and, and what are useful roles for us to be doing? Um, you know, we've kind of jumped in there with, with the consortium. I say jumped in there. I mean, it was a bit of a slow jump, to be honest. Uh, it's, it's taken us three years to get to this point. Anyway, Jack. Um, sorry to um, speak again, but I just I couldn't resist on, on the point of pipeline because, uh, as I was saying, a slight contrast between the programme I'm working on and, say, Acre, where we're much more top-down and you're much more bottom-up. And so we're top-down, but then, lo and behold, surprise, surprise, there's a, there's a lack of well-structured product to invest in. Um, no surprise to anyone in the room. Um, but in, in a sense, coming back to the point about um, distortion and, and crowding out, and we, we, the, the approach that we're taking, and we haven't um, implemented it yet, but we, we, we get it going in a couple of months, is to to work with the private sector provision on investment readiness um, and getting people investment ready. So even, and, and in a sense, this is where, it, for me, it comes back to market systems approaches. Um, and the impact program doesn't think in market systems language, but it embraces the approach because, we, you know, what we did was look at what, what is the private sector provision of investment readiness services from, from consultancy service providers, in this case, in, in Nairobi. I know that's a very hotbed of activity, but you've got to start somewhere. Um, and actually, there's stuff going on. Uh, it's all on a deferred fee basis. So, you know, once you get the investment, the service provider gets paid. But there is a real risk of crowding out that emerging market. And, you know, in a sense, it's fascinating for me in this room full of market systems people that we're talking about, in a sense, are, are we subsidizing the investor or are we leveraging investment? And in a sense, for me, that's not the point, is are we risking crowding out the growth of this market um, by, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, with many of these markets, they're so thin that the risk of crowd out at this stage is minimal. And, you know, you take the, you take the, the East Africa example, in Nairobi, there's a lot going on and you risk crowding out some stuff there, but you probably risk crowding out a lot less in Mombasa. Um, so I do think we need to think about these things a bit more. Just a quick comment on that. Um, uh, to the point about AECF, um, you know, programs like AECF, and obviously AECF is the, by far the biggest, um, you know, you do have to say uh, investors are all going for the AECF grantees, um, and, you know, you've got, you've got other challenge funds, um, and the result, the successful businesses out of the challenge funds, they're the ones that are getting investment. So um, we're... The, the question about market dis dis distortion is a significant one, but I think it's not necessarily only at a market system program level asking, are we as facilitators doing a market function in this particular project over five years in this particular context? But it's a macro question 
about the way DFID is 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 putting its money in. And you know, when we're doing ACFs and, and BIFs, and at the moment it's actually working quite well because the, those grant challenge funds are leading us to the investment pipeline. Just a, a quick second point about Mombasa. Um, it's not really about market distortion, but it, 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 it kind of touches on a, some of the same issues. We've actually pivoted on um, from delivering investment readiness directly in Mombasa to SMEs that we're working with, to actually working through the local lawyers, the local business uh, support organizations, and, and the various kind of professionals that are in that space, partly because of the social, ethnic, um, religious, um, business networks that exist in Mombasa. And we've actually realized that working by helping a, a lawyer, a local lawyer, talk about um, getting an investment is going to go a lot further um, than what we could do. So actually, it's not because we're trying to avoid market distortion. It's actually just because we've realized that the, the local players with the local knowledge and the local networks actually can understand what needs to be said and done much better than we do. So We should be looking at impact investment in two ways. And I don't think the market, if we, if we look at it in the right way, I don't think, I think we were talking like about market distortion. But you never know we've got the best investment in if we make a good one. If we make a good investment, there, there are possibly two options. One is you are inducing an investor who grows to scale because of your investment. And we, I talked to many projects in the last, oh, you know, six weeks, I'm doing some research on scaling up for the English publish that probably as some of you know, and they've identified two ways of getting large scale results, which means large scale impact. One is the investor or the investor, the private investor or the private investors you invest in are themselves going to scale. And they in, in, expand their operations enormously. That's one way of getting impact. And secondly, which is more tricky, is that the investment that you sponsor then encourages other investments you haven't even heard of to invest in, which is, you know, calling in. And I think what we should be looking at in our, in our choice of investors is three things. First of all, will the scenario that we hope for actually produce a large slice of profits for the target group as well. That's the first thing. Of course, it's got to produce profit, or at least initially, for the investor. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it in the first place. And secondly, um, what is the market? And what, who are likely to be entering into the market? In other words, have we got plausible routes to either of these scaling up strategies? Thank you very much. Um, Nabil Kello, I'm from Enterprise Partners in Ethiopia. It's quite interesting to hear um, about the Acre example. Uh, I'll just say a bit about what we're doing in Ethiopia in this market. Um, so there's a, there's a big function um, that exists in private equity and as well as impact investment um, called advisory. And, and as we said, uh, as my colleague said earlier, um, it makes money out of making this market work. Um, we we find that a lot of them don't have the track record um, to, to really sort of be successful. It's quite a thin market. Um, so we work exclusively through them in, in building that, that capacity through a, through a grant instrument and, and a partial loan instrument from a local bank. Um, but at the same time, the, in addition to having a, a sort of competent advisor, you need a willing, um, a willing business, actually, who wants to, to give away some of their equity. Um, and not a lot of businesses understand the, the why they need private equity, what the difference is between that um, and a bank, or the difference between private equity and impact investment, which is actually very minimal, actually. The different, you know, we've, we've seen with a lot of companies the terms, um, the risk appetite, the return expectations of impact investors are more or less the same as private equity. It's just not that much of a difference. Um, so we're working on... on on doing a lot of education, um, a lot of awareness and exposure of the business community around what it takes um, to, to do a deal. 
what you need to invest in, uh, particularly advisory services, that sort of thing, um, and, and, and what you could expect. Uh, so, so it was quite interesting to hear that as, as, market, you know, as market facilitators, we haven't really been talking about making that market, but it sounds like we're doing a bit of the, the direct delivery in that space. Um, I think lastly, from, from the perspective of private businesses, the value proposition of an impact investor is not that different from a private equity fund. Um, I come from a family that has several businesses, one of which recently got um, impact investment in a space where it could have equally gotten private equity. Um, so it was interesting to see an impact investor going into the territory of private equity with subsidized capital. Um, the difference, I think the big, the big value proposition was the impact investor um, often is linked to things like Africa Enterprise Challenge Fund, has good linkages there and can and sort of essentially promise the, the ability to get a grant. So I think we need to be a little bit careful when we're drawing the, the distinctions um, between impact investment, which ideologically and conceptually makes a lot of sense to us. But the reality is, is it's a tiny, tiny market compared to a massive private equity market, which probably delivers a lot more impact. Um, funnily, private equity people often say, well, does that mean we're not impact investors? Um, Private equity delivers a lot more impact for SMEs just on an absolute basis. So I think we need to not exclude that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Rufaro from TechnoServe in Zimbabwe. I just wanted to touch on a couple of points. One being um, you mentioned uh, patient money what exactly is patient money? In our experience, we run a number of programs uh, where we have a challenge fund in particular, and we find that uh, a lot of donors have got very specific periods in which they want to, s to see results. And when you're working with these type of enterprises, the journey isn't three years or five years, it's much longer if you're really going to have the sustainable impact. So which is why you then have a scarcity of potential enterprises you can work with. It was funny that the gentleman from Windward mentioned Biobab as well. I was like, oh, I know them. Um, <laughs> they, because... It, he's <laughs> no, he's lovely. He's absolutely awesome, but he's received from pretty much everybody. And that's because there's this pressure to work with somebody who's able to demonstrate something pretty quickly. So I'd be really interested to hear your views in terms of what patient money is and what duration will actually bring about systemic change um, from that perspective. I'd also like to just talk through one of the things that we've learned uh, in our work is that um, there is, n I don't think there's a scarcity of opportunities, but there's definitely a scarcity of people who are able to package the opportunity well, uh, and that's a distinct difference. There are a number of really high potential players out there who just don't know how to speak the donor language in terms of being attractive to organizations such as ourselves. And I think they are left out of the loop simply because they don't know how to talk the talk. They're not in this in the circles, whatever it is um, that's currently, you know, and they don't, they're not even aware of the opportunities. So I think we just need to be careful in that we ourselves as actors are not um, distorting the market from that perspective in terms of looking for the low-hanging fruit and not really digging deeper to where the real opportunities are, in particular with rural enterprises, because in most cases, it's not actually a rural enterprise. It's an enterprise that happens to have activities in a rural area. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Rutendo. I'm from Zimbisa, uh, also in Zimbabwe. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I found it really interesting. I was uh, interested in finding out a little bit more about the advocacy work that you're trying to support. Um, because Zimbisa, we're a business environment reform program, so we do a lot of advocacy work. You mentioned that you're looking uh, at investing more in enterprises that are going to be performing an advocacy function. Um, so I just wanted to share an experience uh, that we've had. Um, we work with uh, we work at the business membership organization level, so not really at the enterprise level. Um, and one of the business membership organizations that we work with has two uh, enterprises. Uh, this was in the tourism sector. One is an enterprise uh, that does um, hunting. Uh, they promote hunting. They make their revenues through uh, getting hunting clients. 
The other does uh, wildlife photography. Uh, so one enterprise was trying to advocate for the government to increase the quotas of animals that could be hunted, and the other one was trying to get the government to reduce the quota so that there would be more animals that could be photographed. <laughs> so I'm just wondering, um, as you guys are doing your thinking, how, 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 what role do you see Acre playing in helping the enterprises that you'll be supporting identify the right issues, because you might end up with that challenge? Or do you see uh, Acre maybe moving more into supporting organizations that uh, do advocacy work at a notch above what enterprises would be doing? Um, and the issue of patient capital and what ACA does on advocacy, um, please do come and talk to us. Um, I have some copies of, of this, which is a bit of a glossy after year one of ACA um, that was um, produced mainly for investors um, and some of our, our donors. Um, it's been a great discussion. As predicted, there was a real wealth um, of interest and experience and understanding amongst you. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, we're going to break for lunch, and, but we'll stay around to, um, to talk I, I um, was told to tell you. So, on the, like usual, on the tables, there's uh, a feedback form. Uh, it's the usual one. So, if you can fill that out, I think there's also a uh, mailing list. If you want to join a mailing list, I think Beam is interested in getting a sense of what the interest is on this type of topic for future uh, Beam activities. So, if you see that, or if you want to look for that and sign up. Um, but yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone.